home. It's personal. If you're lucky enough to have one, you'll know that already. Here's my home. I'm going to show it to you the best way I know how on a motorbike. Welcome to the northwest of Ireland. Welcome to Sligo. Good morning, baby. Hello. Look, up on the hills. Neolithic passage tombs. Looking down at us from up there. Those things are older than the pyramids. This is my 2014 Triumph Bonneville T100. I know it's ever since I started making videos I've been riding somebody else's bike. But finally, finally, she gets a video all of her own. She's a bit lazy. She doesn't like starting up early in the morning. Let's go! Yet they were of a different kind, the names that still your childish play. They have gone about the world like wind. But little time had they to pray for whom the hangman's rope was spun. And what, God help us, could they save? Romantic Ireland's dead and gone. It's with O'Leary in the grave. The monument. Commemorating the lives of French and Irish fighters who were killed in this place in a battle in 1798, one of the many, many rebellions that have occurred over the course of this country's sad history. Bit of a random thing in Cluny, just one village in the northwest of Ireland to see a plaque in French. The Irish remember, fondly remember the 200 French soldiers who took part in this campaign. This is the village of Caluni, population 1500. Three shops, three schools, three churches, three pubs. Once a prosperous industrial and commercial hub, by the 1950s the mills had shut, followed swiftly by the northwestern rail lines, leaving Caluni, like thousands of other rural villages, empty and stagnant. This is where I went to school, where I sang in the church choir, and where I couldn't wait to escape from as soon as I possibly could. And I did. But then a funny thing happened. Skinny lattes, burritos, Asian street food. The times, it seemed, were finally a-changing. And today, I find myself doing what less than 10 years ago was totally unthinkable, unimaginable, very realistically impossible. I am going to Kaluni for coffee. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Yes. Good. Good. I'm just gonna have a, a, a coffee. Have coffee. And can, Emma used to uh, mind us when we were kids, myself and my two brothers. <laughs> uh. Many moons ago. That's good. <laughs> Joining me for coffee is Ethna, chef, owner, the all-round awesome creative force behind Nook Cafe Restaurant in Cluny. When I was growing up here in Cluny, it was very much uh, recession, post-recession. Yeah. If you wanted something to eat, you would have to go to the Chinese takeaway. Yeah. Or Roberto's, the fish and chips place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember uh, when I was living in Dublin, mum giving me a call and saying, uh, and there's a, 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 a new cafe open in Kalimni. <laughs> what? what do you mean? I know everyone used to say to Kalimni, are you crazy? Like, yeah. it won't work. You know, yeah. who's going to go to Kalimni? And I was like, they'll come. Something different. You have to offer something different. And come they did. The curious, the skeptical, the believers, and the doubters, lured, seduced, and converted by food. New food, exciting food, eye enthralling, nostril thrilling, ecstasy inducingly delicious food. This is what change tastes like. It tastes good, but for some, it can take a little getting used to. Well, I've had people come in and throw menus and say, your menu is, insert curse word here, and <laughs> it's like, this is crap, and yeah, a lot of people weren't happy. But it was a certain generation that would be used to meat, veg, spuds, you know, too much. and yeah, but that's... I did, I did get that reaction. But most of it was positive, like so. Yeah. One thing I didn't notice that was missing from your menu, and it's indicative of 
menus in Ireland in general. Yes. We're 15 minutes from the sea. Yes. No fish. Uh, What's fish. That about? Our menu is seasonal. So okay. I change them three months and kind of in the spring, summer, we would start to bring in seafood then as well. So it's just kind of like whatever's best available then. So every December, I kind of set up my, looking at my January, February, March, then probably go on to eight, but it depends on how the weather is and how seasonal it is. But in the summer, we'll have loads of lovely fresh seafood and mm. yeah. Oh my god. It only sells, it sells really well in the summer. Like, yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so it's, it's all see, it's seasonal as possible. All of meat are Irish. Um, eggs, just balustair, egg the road. All our cheeses are Irish. Um, cheese is one of my things now. I I love kind of finding out new cheeses. Like, I, I, <laughs> like our, our things like our kimchi and things like that, the more kind of exotic ingredients we make from Irish ingredients. So we'd use Irish grown Chinese cabbage or Irish grown say like um, certain parts of the late summer there's like a few uh, local people who would bring in some cabbages and I'd make kimchi from those cabbages like a normal cabbage like a head cabbage I just need to salt it for a bit longer um, free range pork free range as much as possible um, yeah uh, as much as Irish stuff as possible but to try and make kind of tweak things to make kind of the Asian inspired fruit from Irish ingredients yeah and I put a call out maybe every two or three months to say, any new producers out there, anyone who started to make new food products, new cheeses in the area, new meat producers, um, say like, call out and say, anyone interested in popping on our next menu? You know, or to give them a bit of shelf space if they're interested. Do you see yourself and your enterprise as part of the changing landscape of Sligo up in Northwest over the last 15 years? Um, I don't know. Don't be modest. I'm so modest. <laughs> no, I... There's a lot of people um, in a lot of businesses, I think, who are part of it. I mean, there's in particular, in particular female business uh, people, female chefs, are doing great stuff in Sligo. Brilliant stuff. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I never think of myself as, as kind of like separate to anyone else. I just think that like, I'm supposed to just do what I can do and enjoying it but um, I think as a collective there's a lot of people in Sligo who are doing great things for Sligo food wise yeah, I, I couldn't pinpoint an individual for myself exactly. I think there's yeah, it's, yeah, yeah are you into poetry in any way I write poetry well I've then. written poetry I don't find it this is a really weird thing actually that you asked that question I've written poetry since the songs I can remember like genuinely the songs I can remember and one of I don't make news resolutions I had to make a few this year, I suppose, on a health basis. But one of my New Year's resolutions, which is separate, is, is to get back into my poetry again. Um, and to take a kind of a, more time with it. Because it's something I've loved and I've enjoyed all my life. And I have gotten back into it again. And I've actually started a brand new collection of poems. And I'm hoping to, hoping to get well, at least one poem published this year. They were always quite personal. My poetry is very personal. Kind of a collection that I've started now is about Carol Keel. So I, I think we're going to have to have a whole meeting just for this. <laughs> that question. Cast a cold eye on life, on death. Horseman pass by. Yes. What does it mean? I have thought about it before. Um, and I've read people's interpretations on it. I honestly don't know. Because the reason I can say I don't know, and I probably will never know, and most people probably won't, is because... As someone who writes poetry themselves, I could write things and someone would say, I know what you mean, I can interpret that means, and they're way off. Like, if you're like, I think the words that come into your head for, for certain feelings or for certain, certain emotions that you might put into your poetry, they're very personal. I can remember writing poems, like, I can remember writing a poem when I was in secondary school, and I think the teacher around my parents and said, This is very depressing, and we're kind of worried about her. And I went, Yeah, and I was like, that's a love poem. <laughs> yeah. like, That's a love poem. And um, yeah, so it, you, nobody knows. I don't know. Like only post. Yeah. Right. I'm gonna hit the road, Ethna. Thank you so much. It's been a welcome. pleasure to meet you. Me too. See you, Emma. Bye bye. All right. Let's go climb the mountain.
Alistair and Conan and Finn were there when we followed a deer with our bay and hounds, with Bran, Sheolan and Lomer, and passing the Fearbulk's burial mounds, came to the cairn-heaped grassy hill where passionate Maeve is stony still, and found, on the dove-grey edge of the sea, a pearl-pale high-born lady who rode on a horse with a bridle of Findrony, and like a sunset were her lips, a stormy sunset on doomed ships, a citron colour bloomed in her hair. And the mountains here are made out of water. <laughs> Few things can entice me up a mountain, I admit it. I am a self-confessed disciple of the don't run if you can walk, don't stand if you can sit down gospel. You can bet then, if you do happen to glimpse the rare species that is the wet, panting, mountain climbing variety of Ferdia, there is a damn good reason for it. And as always, my reasons usually look like, as my brother once so astutely observed, piles of stones. But these stones are special. They were carried in their thousands to the summit more than 5,000 years ago in an undertaking so impressive, so bewilderingly extraordinary as to be fully deserving of the term monumental. This is a Neolithic passage tomb, a millennia spanning testament to the people who once lived here and a sacred place of rest for the dead they laid here. And this is just one of hundreds. Sligo has amongst the highest concentration of megalithic monuments in Europe, transforming this already beautifully wild and rugged topography into an ancient and mysterious ritual landscape. It is truly unique. And it is in danger. Countless megalithic monuments have been lost to human destruction over the centuries, and unfortunately, this continues into the 21st century. This tomb, already in bad state, was further purposefully damaged two years ago by vandals, metal detectorists, or quarried for its minerals. This despicable act is not only the irreparable damaging of an important historical site, but also the willful desecration of countless individuals' final resting place. I blame both the people's lack of awareness of the importance and context of these sites and the state's persistent indifference towards protecting any of the easily tourist exploitable megalithic sites in this country. This has to change and, like all change, it can only begin with the people, with us. So for what it's worth, consider this my meagre call to arms. This mural here was done in 2016 to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the 1916 Rising in Dublin. The lady on the far right is uh, Countess Makovic, a uh, member of the Dáil, that's the Irish Parliament, and uh, one of the leaders of the Rising in Dublin. She's from here, from Sligo. And yeah, this is the outskirts of Sligo town. Smallish town, not a city despite what some of us would like you to have you believe. Definitely a time. Uh, we'll go in later, but right now let's, uh, let's fight past. And just up here on the right actually is uh, Sligo IT, uh, third level institute of technology, which um, adds a, a much needed uh, student young vibe to the town. Uh, Pre-COVID times, of course, it was uh, there was quite a lot going on in Sligo Town for its size, uh, thanks in no small part to the student population. I'm sure all that will go back to normal one of these days. Actually, I wonder if Steve is around. Let's uh, let's pop in, see what's going on. There's really nothing worse than being caught in your lunch break by a man with a camera and being dragged away to talk about Sligo for a YouTube video and, unfortunately for Steve, that's exactly what's just happened. Musician, rock star, living legend turned fine art student at Sligo IT. Fortunately for me, today, Steve didn't seem to mind too much. I came here for Flarkeol in 1989 
and I really liked the place and I kind of, um, my partner at the time had a holiday home. She was from Dublin but they, her father was from Sligo and nobody was using it so we came down and, and moved out there in Cashel Garen, North Sligo. Right. And I haven't managed to escape. Why? Why? Yeah. What's holding you back? Well, nothing because I, I managed to, what I do is I do an awful lot of travelling and I love Sligo. I really love it. It's a great place for home, uh, to call home. It's not a great place if you want to kind of go to loads of things or events or buy shit sure. and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, if you want to, um, you know, be near the Atlantic Ocean, it's so amazing and the great outdoors for me. When I moved down here, my children were very young. So we were living in a little house in Dublin and there was mountains and lakes and the Atlantic Ocean and walks and forests and um, lots of nature lots of silence, lots of great skies, and a really, really accurate big part of me was, was traditional Irish music, because I'm a violin player, yeah. yeah. And uh, Sligo was a kind of hotbed, or was at the time a hotbed of traditional Sligo style, yeah. 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 And uh, so there was a real tradition that was taken over by people like Dervish and Moxie in the meantime, and there's a new cycle of great musicians who were, have taken on that, um, you know, whatever it is, it's a relay race that every generation has down to the next one. Sure, sure. But what is it about the silence then? This seems sort of paradoxical. Your silence? Job, your life is to oh, make Oh, silence noise, is fantastic. Oh yeah, but it's the silence, is the canvas that you throw the noise on. You need the silence. That has to be the first part. And then everything, every noise you make after the silence is is, uh, is the mark that you're making musically. So um, silence is essential for a musician. I, I live near um, a place called the Giant's Grave. It's it's um, it's up in Deer Park. It's okay. in Colliery. It's a, it's an old megalithic tomb that sits on top of a mountain. Uh, so that's I go walking up there regularly. So that's a nice. Uh, place for me to be sometimes. So there's great views over, you can see the two mountains at the same time, Ben Bulban and, and Knocknaray sure. talking to each other across Ligo Bay. Uh, I love Knocknaray, I love Strand Hill, I love, um, there's lots of great places it's like Ross's Point, my, I had an old aunt out there. So, you know, Sligo is full of beautiful places. I love going out in the lake, I have a little boat and I go out to Inish Free and out to Beezy's Island and all those places. You've been out there, haven't you? Never. Never? Never. No, oh man! Oh, you gotta get a get, get a boat, get a boat, rowboat, and go out in the eye, uh, out in the lake. Yeah, fantastic. Oh yeah. Fantastic. Is there much going on in Sligo Town these days? Covid kind of put a stop to everything, but I think that we're all starting to have fun again. Um, Sligo Town is a very small town. There's about um, there's plenty going on if you want to look for it. There's so many musicians in Sligo, so many traditional musicians, folk musicians, rock musicians amazing amount of musicians so um, before COVID you know we had loads of gigs everywhere there was shoots there was uh, swag man small gigs up to up to bigger gigs like the Hawkswell and the model and so there's plenty of hopefully they'll all start rocking and rolling again you know they, we all have to get out and enjoy life and celebrate it you have to live we have to live you know yourself you've got to go out and uh, you, you, there's no rehearsals for this life it's a one and you got to live the life that you love and if you can manage to do that it's a lot easier if we go out to the country buy a little place for you know that you can afford and you know be a traditional musician and play a few gigs and pay for the mortgage and that's that's simplicity is a good one I think simplicity is a great one for me anyway that's what works out for me clearly before I let you go uh, yeah what comes to your mind when I say Cast a cold eye on life and death, <laughs> horseman Well, I think uh, the thing I think about that is it's. Um, I've often thought about that one. He was a great man for the words WBH. That's his epitaph that's on his grave in, in um, up in Drumcliff. But I think about the consonants of that. So if you think of the consonants, he signed. It's a clippity clop of a horse gone by. So beautiful. 
it all comes down to the yeah. sound at the end of the day. Uh, for him, I think yeah. he was musical. It was a musical, fr little musical phrase. Cast no. the gold eye on life and death, horse man, that's why. Who means it's enigmatic, isn't it? Steve, thanks so much. Hey, good luck, man, with your adventures. What a, what a great life you have. days where the the rain just comes in waves off the coast it'll come in fast it'll turn everything uh, misty and gray for about an hour and then it'll blow over and then an hour later a new cloud will come in it's pretty normal some days it just comes down and descends and doesn't move and sometimes for days and it's just meek or not meek murky and bleak <laughs> that's it Murky and bleak. Uh, but today we're getting spells of rain and spells of of dry. Well, what a view, huh? What a view. Like to look at that. So this is an up gill, uh, an unlock gill, actually, just around that headland. We're not going to go over to it. Well, unlock gill is the infamous Lake Isle of Inish Free, made famous, of course, by that that poem by that one guy that goes, "I will arise and go now and go to Inish Free." I really don't like that poem at all. That's why I'm not going to say. That's why we're not going to the Isle of Inish Free because. Honestly, it's a bit of a letdown, considering how infamous the poem is. Anyway, here comes the rain. It's caught up with us. Now oh, well, some things you just can't outrun. Let's get out of here. It obviously was in February when Yeats felt inspired to write all his poems about this place. I feel inspired to do now is get a point. I 
I suppose at this point I need to address the elephant in the room, the literal cloud hanging over this video. Because as much as I try to sell Sligo to you by showing you our spectacular wild landscape, our warm character, our dark humour, there is no getting around the fact that the weather here is terrible. I can't think of a more direct word for it, but I'm trying to keep this family friendly. And it's not just Sligo, it's the entire west coast, and it all comes down to this. The omnipresent, relentless North Atlantic Ocean. For five and a half thousand kilometers, the prevailing southwesterly wind gathers up the sea in great grey sheets and tosses them against the western seaboard. It has molded both this landscape and these people in its image, being both life giver and life taker. Tragedy that occurred in 1588 when three ships of the Spanish Armada on the way back from Spain via Scotland, North of Ireland, down south were wrecked right here off the coast of Scotland in a storm with loss of over 1,200 lives. Here we are here. This is Sligo. And these little red dots are all the wrecks. You can see they're scattered all the way down along the west coast. One of the shipwreck survivors, Captain Francisco de Cuellar, washed ashore here at Strigia Beach, the beginning of an epic odyssey through 16th century Ireland. Evading English patrols and aided by local peasants and chieftains, de Cuellar eventually returned to Spain. His written account of his journey is both an invaluable historical document and a riveting read. To this day, annual commemorations are held here in Sligo with the support of the Spanish Embassy to respect and remember the thousands of Spanish who, alongside countless others, met their end in the wrath of the Atlantic Ocean. Where the wave of moonlight glosses the dim grey sands with light, Far off by furthest Rosses we foot it all the night, Weaving old and dances mingling hands and mingling glances Till the moon has taken flight, To and fro we leap and chase the frothy bubbles, While the world is full of troubles and anxious in its sleep. Come away, O human child, to the waters and the wild with a fairy, Hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. Well, Philippe. <laughs> Another Spaniard who washed up here and never left is this guy, an awesome guitarist and good friend, Philippe. Did you notice that? I am very proud of this shirt. What's of that? this t-shirt. What is it? Looking a lot of small fishes beat the big fish. <laughs> oh. what, what brought you from sunny um, New York? I decided to give myself a chance to discovered another country. Um, I was working as an ass officer in, in New York at the time and uh, I had enough of what I was doing at the time and I got offered to move to Ireland to work uh, in the music industry as a band manager for the band called Dervish. Uh, no, hey, so that's the reason why I moved to Ireland. Music. Music brought me here. Well, music, music brought me here the first time around and I came in 92 I think as a, as a tourist. A typical tourist that couldn't speak a word of English and was trying to get along. <laughs> but that's the beauty of Ireland, to my view, as a Spaniard uh, living in this part of the world, is the, the people. The people are extraordinarily special and uh, very welcoming and accepting of uh, different backgrounds and uh, very welcoming. That's uh, very friendly and welcoming. Sure. Watch the crack. So it's a yeah, it's a very special place, and particularly the northwest. I find it extremely attractive. Uh, 
physically or the landscape wise. Well, oh, I got soaked on the way out here. You did? Yeah. Well, does, does, it, does it not ever make you oh, miss Mallorca? Uh, well, I tell you what, the summer of 98, I was hoping for a summer to <laughs> arrive and I'm still waiting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, though, the, the weather is a bit the, the downside of this part of the world. But um, to me, it's, 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 it's incredible the diversity of the landscape in, in this county. And funny enough, it's, it's like we've never been the, the, the highlight uh, tourist wise or tourism wise uh, when people come from outside Ireland. I mean, it's not the first destination that is advertised in, in Dublin Airport anyway, but um, more the, the Kerry production or the Connemara and all that. Whereas Lego is probably a hidden gem for for me I mean they, they, I completely agree I mean, the, the diversity mountain sea landscape farm rivers and all sorts of uh, um, natural natural beauties that the county has to offer it's astonishing so I'm absolutely delighted that after four years uh, making up my mind if I wanted to go back to Spain or not because I was in a career break at the time um, after four years, I found a beautiful house in here in the village of Stone Hill and we decided to buy it and the rest of history settled in perfectly. With, uh, we don't know the means in the Stone Hill, but most of us are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think I'm nearly accepted at this stage. Yeah. That, a, a nearly local. Aspect. That tourism aspect is fascinating because. In the last 10 years, we've seen the development of the Wild Atlantic Way. Absolutely. And that's yeah. been a huge success. Mm. Yep. Do you think uh, there is more that Sligo could do? More aspects that it could promote to mm. bring people here? Well, I'm sure the tourism authorities would have different ways to, to approach the, how to attract more tourism. But uh, I come from, uh, from the island of Mallorca and uh, my experience with tourism is very different to the experience of tourism that we have here in, in, in Ireland in general. So I would be always very wary of the, the potential damage that uh, too much tourism are, um, can provoke to a, a piece of land. My, my little island, Mallorca, is very small the size of countries like maybe are a bit more I'm not sure now which but they, uh, it's totally destroyed absolutely destroyed by greed and by uh, the, yeah we sold our land and our culture and our language and everything else and our granny as well for the price of a sausage so uh, there because of that I've always been kind of scared of uh, the possibility of developing the tourism industry to levels that are not sustainable, which is what has happened in the island and in, and in most of the Mediterranean coast because of the weather or whatever. So in one sense, thanks be to God, a lot of rain in Ireland and a lot of particularly in Sligo, so we won't get that far developing 24 floors uh, of uh, blocks of apartments in the coast. Yeah, sure. They'd fucking blow yeah, over, yeah. wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> they do, too. So one thing I've been asking everybody, because it's it's been it's been on my mind, I've been trying to figure it out. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about it. Uh, cast a cold eye on life on death. Hmm. Horsemen pass by. What's it mean? Christ, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and yet this day, so we can ask him. <laughs> Fine, um, that settles it. <laughs> I suppose there's plenty of theories behind, and uh, I read some of them, but uh, to be honest, it's, it's a bunch of beautiful words put together, but I I do write uh, songs, I do write poetry, and, and sometimes I analyse my own words, and uh, sometimes I do remember the way I wrote them and what they meant, and sometimes I don't. So I just let them be. So I presume, yes, maybe in the night out he wrote those. <laughs> I, my knowledge of the language doesn't go that deep to be able to interpret these beautiful words. So I, 
I leave it there. That's my answer to it. <laughs> All right, we, uh, you're, you're done. You're happy? Yeah. Well done. You're done. Boy! <laughs> Not at all, thank you. <laughs> Slight was a lot of connection with, with Spain, the, the, uh, the Armada, a lot of uh, the ships were, were off the street uh, strand, that's a few miles just up, up the road here from Slight, well, and, with, uh, and uh, when the Spanish soldiers came, came, came out of the sea, the local people thought they were, they were angels. <laughs> My friend, Eric, Sligo Town native, known to all, the face who's always happy to see you. Eric has lived in Sligo all his life and is therefore more qualified than I'll ever be to talk about life here, present and past. I was born in 1957, near the end of 1957. Fianna Fáil was after winning, after winning the election. And when I, uh, what I heard, Sligo was very, it was very ba badly run down in 1957. There was a lot of immigration. Uh, matter of fact, my three old, uh, oldest family had to leave Sligo for true immigration. You know, they went to, one, uh, two uh, went to England and one went to the Netherlands, went to Holland to live. There was poverty because there was ten children in the family, seven boys and three, and, 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 and three girls, ten children. And my father was a very, uh, you know, he was independent, he didn't, he didn't want to, and then when he died, my mother, uh, my mother didn't even get a full, she didn't even want to give her a full pension. After my father worked 36 years in, in, a, in a multinational company called Savoy Cinema. And that's how he was. He was, he was, he was treated very bad, but he was treated very bad. He only got off one night a week and they didn't treat, they didn't, they broke his heart at cinema. So, you know, he would have been better off if he immigrated, you know. And, uh, and the, the, my mother was a fighter. She fought hard for her husband, right? And she fought hard for us to keep, uh, keep a roof over her head. Mm. She was a fight. She was like the old women from Dublin. She fought hard. And she, 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 she just fought hard. And she, if there was jobs to be done, my mother did it. And she worked. And then when, when my father uh, died in 1965, we only, I was only eight years old at the time. And... Uh, she was waiting for well, she was waiting for the widow's pension to come through. She was just waiting for the widow's pension, and you know, and at that time it would take maybe three months to six months for the pension to come through. And they, 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 she wasn't paying the rent at that time. She wasn't she wasn't paying the rent, and my my uh, the the the, um, the government the government sent. The local government council sent up notices. Quit. Fords had to get out of the house. Big white, big white sheets on the doors. Fords had to quit. And my mother couldn't understand it. It was either feed the children, feed the children, or the, or pay the rent. And my mother chose to feed us before she paid, before she paid, she put before she paid the rent. So anyway, she uh, she paid the rent, and that day I, I remember the house was sieged. The house I'm living in was sieged by cruelty man, the Garda, the Garda, the rent men. They roll up to get a widow woman out. And this is not this is not uh, 1926 or 1916. This is 1966. My mother had to, my mother tells us, Eric. And uh, get her, he's the youngest, run up the stairs. We had to run up the stairs and, and we, hide, we had to hide under the bed. And she had to face all these people, my mother. She, uh, they wanted it to, my mother didn't want us to go to a, a reformatory school because she was brought up in an orphanage herself. And she knew if we, if we went to her, she'd never see us again or maybe some of us would die in that in letter friendship. But she stood up, she stood up for ground. But, but then she, she went to her brother-in-law at that time called John Fallon. The bridge is called after him there. And she went to him and she told them, she said, her plight, she said, about the pension. She was treated like a criminal. She said, look at, she said, the pension has to come through. I had to feed the children. They put me out of the house. I have no place to go. And John Fallon at that time said, right, he said, 
I paid the rent for you. He paid the rent for him of eight pound. It was only eight pound. He paid eight pound. Eight pound was a lot of money at that time. Eight pound. He paid eight pound for her. And then, and then she wasn't. She wasn't put out of the house. And we we survived because my mother only for our only for our mother. But what annoyed my mother was this. It was 1966. It was probably March coming up the March April. And it was coming near the celebration of the 15th anniversary of the 1916 uh, people who, sh who, who get their lives or Ireland. And they're all wearing, all wearing green uniforms and saluting the flag. And here, my mother, a, wi a widow woman in 19, uh, 19, uh, 1966, being kicked out of her little house. And she had to fight. And these people were saying, oh, Ireland was great. We're pretty, we're, we're, they were too nationalistic, too Catholic. To understand the, the plight of the poor, so you know, so my mother fought hard for us. She died in like she died a young woman in ninety. She died when she was only fifty five. She died, uh, uh, and she was a fighter. She said, "We have to fight to survive, Eric." She used to say that we had to fight. I was only nineteen when she died, and. Uh, my father died when I was here. These are people, the reason they died young was because they had to fight to survive for the They had to fight. And I'm not exaggerating, they had to fight to survive. And that's what, you know, you know, I, I, I do hear people writing books, and, but, but, but I lived through all that. We didn't have a shower in that. In the, we didn't have a shower in those combination houses. We didn't have a bat. Do you ever get nostalgic for Sligo as it was after all the change that you've seen? It's, yeah, I think it's great to see Sligo the way it's changed. Because years ago, back when I was growing up in Ireland, Ireland was all Catholic, all white, and all Irish, which was not good. You know, and like we need to have, we need, we need to have other. We're just as Ireland is as good as other European countries now. I've been to Spain, I've been, I've been to Germany, I've be, been to England, and we're just as good as any other European, uh, other European co country. And that's thanks to the EU. It was good. That was the best day ever that Ireland joined the EU. One random question. Cast a cold eye on life, mm. on death, horsemen pass by. Mm. What do you think it means? Well, uh, some people believe that it could be to do with Jesus coming back. You see, he, he, Yeats was an atheist, you see. He was a pro he was proper Protestant. Uh, and, and he, but he was into witchcraft in a big way. And he was into uh, seeing fairies and seeing ghosts and everything like that. He was a bit of, you know, he, he, was, he, he was a bit of a, you know, uh, he was a, he was a bit away with the fairies himself, you know. But W. B. Yeats, like like a, like W. B. Yeats, he didn't really understand the Sligo people, you know. He he he, he came into Sligo, but he never mixed with the O.V. people of the town, and you know he, he you know he, he never mixed. He, did, he he his brother Jack, I think, was a more friendlier type of a fella. I and when W. B. Yeats left uh, left. Uh, Dublin, he, he came to live here with his grandfather, but uh, I heard on one occasion that uh, W.B. Yeats was, um, his brother Jack brought him into Hargillan's Bar and uh, in O'Connell Street, and W.B. Yeats couldn't wait to get out of Hargillan's Bar because he, 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 cause people were friendly and they were talking and he just, he just ran out of the bar. <laughs> Solid as a chair from an older time. You watched me slowly grow away from you. Only half understood the things I had to do. But you let me try, although it brought the pain to you. You let me try. Had I the heavens embroidered cloths and wrought with golden and silver light, the blue and the dim and the dark cloths of night and light and the half light, I would spread the cloths under your feet, but I, being poor, have only my dreams. The best and oldest furniture cannot be rearranged. If it suits the way. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread 
on my dreams. Irish poets, learn your trade. Sing whatever is well made. Well, I'm no poet, and it's been a long day. Home. It's personal. But here, you'll always find us willing to share it with you. If you live here, I hope I've done our little piece of the world some justice, and for those of you who don't, well, the door is always open. Just maybe bring a raincoat. Under Bear Ben Bulbin's head in Drumcliff Churchyard, Yates is laid. An ancestor was rector there long years ago. A church stands near, by the road, an ancient cross. No marble, no conventional phrase. On limestone quarried near the spot by his command, these words are cut. The best of all this furniture cannot be rearranged. If it suits the way it is, there is no Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed that. I am back in Cordoba, in the sunny south of Spain. Thank God. Um, but I really enjoyed bringing you Sligo, filming it and editing it to show you my home. So yeah, thank you for watching. Um, this is the second film now. I'm using the word film liberally, of course, but it's the second film that we have on our, our channel. Um, so thank you so much to everyone who has uh, supported me and allowed me to do this work. The last video, Searching for Tetesos, is doing really well. I'm quite happy with that. So guys, thank you, especially uh, Molly, Paul, John, Joy and uh, Monica. Thank you so much, guys. And if you enjoy these videos and you'd like to support us and help us grow, like um, maybe getting mufflers for the microphones, I'm so sorry for the amount of wind noise in that video, oh my god. But it sort of just does come with the territory, filming in the northwest of Ireland in February. Um, but yeah, mufflers for the microphones, that's, uh, that's a good one to keep in mind. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to help us, you can find a link to our PayPal in our website. The link is uh, in the description, of course. That's it, guys. Until next time. Thanks very much. See ya. <laughs>